Thank you, and once again, good morning to students and teachers of the Word of God. We are continuing in the Theological Seminar of the Air, our studies in Christology, the Bible verses and the Bible doctrines that deal with the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ. As we said before in these broadcasts, these are theological broadcasts which deal primarily with Bible doctrine. That is absolute truth, what the Bible said about itself, and what it says about these important matters to deal with Jesus Christ. We are not concerned in these broadcasts with what somebody thinks the Scripture says, nor are we primarily concerned with what somebody has, what somebody has done with the Scripture to make the Scripture say something it doesn't say. By that I mean this. Very often in theological seminars and seminaries, we find professors who have a habit of simply running to the Greek or the Hebrew every time they find something they don't like, and force the Bible to say something that it did not say to prove something that is not so. Uh, this is not a particular theological discipline in these broadcasts. Our work here is to bring you what the Bible says about itself. We assume the Scriptures to be the final authority, and we assume that them to be the best commentary on the Scriptures possible. The best interpreter of the Scripture, of course, is the Scripture itself. Or as Martin Luther used to say, some of the church fathers ought to have been called the church babies, and the thunder with the church fathers, what saith the Scripture? That's the problem. Now, we've discussed at length the uh, matters dealing with the first person of the Godhead, God the Father, in earlier broadcasts. Now, we've been continuing on some time now, a good while, for at least 22 broadcasts on these subjects. Out of these 22 broadcasts, about uh, 15 of them have been devoted already to the uh, Bible verse to deal with the nature, person, and work of the Lord Jesus Christ. Our subject today is the sinlessness of Christ. On previous broadcasts, we've given ample proof that Jesus Christ was a human being and that he was a real man in the sense that a man is a man in discussing the humanity of Christ. We've also given abundant evidence that he was God manifest in the flesh, what we call the deity of Christ, and we've discussed this unique relationship between the Father and the Son. We've also taken up 22 arguments against the deity of Christ and thoroughly answered these arguments from the Word of God. If you've been studying with us on these theological broadcasts from week to week, you should have at your fingertips now, uh, this being the 25th broadcast, you should have at your fingertips now more than 400 verses to deal with these important matters, the matters of uh, God the Father and God the Son as they're related to the Godhead, the Trinity, more than 400 verses. And today we take up a discussion of the sinlessness of Christ. Now, we have learned that Jesus was born without original sin in the sense of the Adamic nature, that is, without a sin nature, and this was by virtue of the fact that he was virgin-born without a human father. We have learned that by comparing verse with verse and accepting the testimony of eyewitnesses to the fact. In our lesson today, we go one step farther and show that Jesus lived his whole life without sin, without committing even one sin, that is, he lived and died without any taint of sin whatsoever. Now, if this is true, and let me say again that in these broadcasts we're not trying to ram anything down your throat, you can always turn the dial. If this is true, Jesus Christ is immediately placed in a unique position that Buddha and Laotse and Laotse and uh, Muhammad and the rest of them cannot possibly occupy. And this is what the world system has against biblical Christianity. Biblical Christianity. Now, you understand, I didn't say Christianity. Biblical Christianity, that is, that portion of Christianity made up of saved people who believe the Bible to be the Word of God. Biblical Christianity. Biblical Christianity has always accepted the great truth that Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life, and that no man can come to the Father except by Him. The world's opinion of this matter is, don't stick your nose in our business, we're all trying, and who are you to judge us? That's their attitude. They may not say it that way. They have a nice way of putting it. They say, well, after all, we're all working to get to the same place, and each uh, has his own way of getting to the same place, so don't criticize each other's ways. And our answer to that is very simple. That's very true. You're all working to get to hell, and you'll make it if you're not careful. Now, that's what is wrong with the Bible. The thing that's wrong with the Bible is it is against human nature and runs contrary to human nature. And that's why people will accept any combination of religions before they will believe what God said. 
And what God said was your religion wouldn't get you anywhere. Every man at his best state is altogether vanity. All our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. That's why people don't like the Bible. It knows all about them and tells it. The Bible distinguishes two religions. God's religion, where your salvation is completed and done, and you get it by accepting a free gift, and man's religion, where you set up a set of things that you think is right and do the best you can to keep them. And in this respect, in the Bible, we're speaking always within a Bible context, in this respect, in the Bible, Mohammedism, Buddhism, Catholicism, Protestantism, Judaism, Taoism, Confucianism, and Ramakrishna are all the same group. That is, every one of them is a system of works that self-righteous people follow to justify their own sins. And there isn't a dime of truth between them. And that's why the world is set against that Bible and why that Bible is set against the world. Because if there's one thing that Bible makes clear, it makes clear that uh, a man is saved by grace through faith and not of works, lest any man should boast. And it was not according to our works of righteousness, but according to his mercy he saved us. Now, it is true that Jesus Christ was not a hybrid, half God and half man. He was true man and true God, without being a mixture of the two natures. The two natures of the Savior were separate and distinct in every respect, and the human nature, the son of Mary, the seed of David, the son of man, was sinless. There is no case on record in any book about Jesus Christ written at that time by any eyewitness who knew him or saw him that he ever could be accused of one sin per se. Now, it's true they accuse him of this. They call him a wine-bibber and a glutton. But it is also true that they call him the prince of devils, Beelzebub, and some other uncharitable things, none of which were true. The manhood of Jesus is essentially one with ours. It is a distinctive human phenomenon. He was an ideal man. He was a perfect and normal man, what a man should be. The Lord Jesus Christ was unique because of his life of sinlessness, a completely unspotted life, and no man on God's earth could claim this but him. And if he claimed it was not so, he was a liar. Now, choose upside and throw mud balls. You can't get around it. He claimed to be sinless, and the record present him as sinless. Now, he was or he was not. In the uh, uh, funny bunny rock opera, Jesus Christ Superstar, He's presented as weak, which is a sin. He's represented as doubting, and whatever is not a faith is sin. He's represented as a sinner. Well, either was or wasn't. Now, that's the end of that. There's any halfway ground. How many laws do you have to break to be a lawbreaker? Are you trying to tell me you have to break more than one law to be a lawbreaker? Not according to police court. A lawbreaker breaks a law. He either broke them or, or he didn't. Now, to those of us who know the Lord Jesus Christ, our Savior, none of this uh, is worthy of our time or our study. However, to some of you educated folks who think you're smart because you've read a lot of junk, you might spend some time with it. For example, it might be interesting for you to do a research paper on the differences between biblical Christianity and other religions instead of trying to find the similarities and put them together in one big indiscriminate magpie nest it might pay you to face the startling fact that any religious teacher could be present with his dead corpse present with his followers, and his followers could still be good, whatever they were, with the corpse on the table. You said, I don't understand what you're saying. I mean, the corpse of Buddha does not affect the teachings of Buddha. The corpse of Muhammad did not affect the teachings of Muhammad. The corpse of Mao Tse, Tung, or Lao Tse, does not affect their little red books and their teachings. What I'm saying is there's only one religion per se on the face of this earth where if they could find the body, the religion wouldn't be worth 15 cents. And that is biblical Christianity. If you had the dead corpse of Moses and David on the table, it wouldn't affect an Orthodox Jew one way or another as far as their religion is concerned. That is, there isn't any religion in the world that can't get along with a dead Savior who never came up except biblical Christianity. Now, have you thought about that? 
Have you faced that one? Every religion in the world is dead and can follow the leadings or teachings of a dead teacher who is dead and never came up because they're all dead. But the body of Jesus Christ rose from the dead, and if it didn't, then all the religions are the same. If it did, then none of them are like it. It hangs in the resurrection. And we'll talk about that more in our lessons on Christ when we get to the great subject of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, where 500 eyewitnesses who saw him come up from the dead and reduced their testimony to written material that has never since that been conclusively disproved. Now, what do we talk about when we talk about the sinless of Jesus Christ? By the sinless of Jesus Christ, we mean, first of all, sinfulness is a want of conformity to the will of God. Sinlessness is complete conformity to the will of God 24 hours a day. In Hebrews chapter 10, verse 7, Christ said, Lo, I come to do thy will, O God. And in John 17, 4, the Lord Jesus said, I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. Our sinfulness is antagonism toward the will of God and deviating from the uh, path of God and deviating toward the path of sin. Sinlessness is being in harmony with God, submissive to God, and staying on the path 24 hours a day. Sin is external, like lying, stealing, and murder. It is also internal, Matthew 15, 19. The thoughts of the heart being the root of later even a- evil actions. For example, out of the abundance of a man's heart, his mouth speaks. A man that damns everything all day long where he works and says hell this and hell that in the place where he works is a man who is speaking from the heart. He has hell and damnation in his heart as a foretaste of what's coming. And if you ever doubt of this, you talk to some of these people and they'll say, well, I believe your heaven or hell is here on earth. You can make it a heaven or hell on earth. Do you know why they say that? Because they've got a foretaste of hell before they got there. Now, Jesus was sinless both externally and internally. He not only abstained from evil deeds, but there were no evil thoughts present with him. He was completely conformed to that which is good and holy at all times. Hebrews 7, 26 describes the sinlessness of the Lord Jesus Christ when it says he was, quote, holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners. Peter described the sinlessness when he said, quote, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot, 1 Peter 1.19. And the thought is also expressed in the writer of Hebrews in Hebrews chapter 9, verse 14. Now, the fact of the sinless of Christ is this. In Acts 4.27 and 4.30, we read, Thy holy child Jesus. This expression occurs twice, signifying that from birth he was holy, pure, sinless, and free from defilement. Thy holy child Jesus. The New Bible is recommended by conservatives and liberals, fundamentalists and neo-orthodox, have all changed Acts 4.27 and Acts 4.30, because all these Bibles were written by men who basically resented the authority of the King James Bible and its stand for the truth. So you'll find the word child has been changed in Acts 4.27 and Acts 4.30 in all the New Bibles. You say, how many of them? All of them. All of them. Bibles that are translated in the Laodicean period for the Laodicean church are Bibles translated from Vaticanus and Sinaiticus, 3rd century manuscripts that bear the imprint of the Asikian Alexandrian type manuscript from North Africa, which contains the Apocrypha and all is the Word of God, more than 30,000 places in both Testaments. Now, the devil recognized Jesus as, quote, the Holy One of God, Mark 124, which is never said of Muhammad nor is it ever said of Buddha, the Holy One of God. Nor does any devil or demon ever recognize the deity of anybody else but Jesus Christ. The demons in Luke 4.34 cry out, quote, I know thee who thou art, the Holy One of God. The strongest proof of the sinlessness of Christ is not the testimony of the devils, however, but the plain inspired Word of God, which says, 1 Peter 2.21 Christ did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth. First John chapter 3, verse 5 says, quote, And you know he was manifested to take away our sins, and in him is no sin. Absolutely not one trace of sin in our blessed Savior. 
And that's why he's able to save sinners. He's sinless. No waste our time talking about uh, other religions and transcendental meditation to get out of the frame. We need a payment for our sins. Are you trying to tell me that when you're not practicing TN, you're living a sinless life? Are you trying to tell me that you're living sinless now that you're practicing TN? Who are you trying to kid, your grandmother? And if you were, what about the sin before you found prajna or samadhi or nirvana or whatever your crowd calls it? Don't kid us, boys and girls. We weren't born yesterday or the day before. A man came to a man and said, I can't pay you the money I owe you, but I promise never to borrow from you again. The man said, look here, you borrowed a $1,000 from me four times running. What about that? The fellow said, I've repented, I've confessed, I believe and been baptized, and I promise you I'm never going to borrow again. Suppose he doesn't. What does that prove? What about what he already owed? If you could live a sinless life from this moment on for the next 30 years, what would that prove? What about the backlog? Second Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21 says, quote, For God hath made him, not Jesus, to be sin for us, who knew no sin. He never even became acquainted with sin. Jesus and sin were total strangers. And his first experience with sin was when he bore your sins in his own body on the cross and became sin for you and became a curse for you. Hebrews 4.15 says, quote, For we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Did you get that? Yet without sin. 1 John 3, 3 says, Jesus Christ is pure. For John said, Everyone who hath the hope of the second coming of Christ will, quote, purify himself even as he is pure. Jesus Christ was perfect purity, perfect spotless, sinless humanity, with a heart and a mind and a soul more sensitive to righteousness than the most sensitive, cultured, educated woman that ever lived on the face of this earth. And that's why old wives' fables are often invented to get folks off into meditation to prevent them from trusting somebody who's sinless. One of these old sisters said, there is no sin. It's just all in your mind. We know death's in your mind and all that kind of business. The little boy knocked at the door of the house and said, can I... Uh, well, the little boy was at the door of the house. The lady came by and knocked at the door of the house. She said, the little boy, she said, is your daddy home? He said, uh, well, he can't come. He's sick. And the lady at the house who carried her literature with her said, now... Son, uh, he isn't really sick. There's no such thing as sickness. He just thinks he's sick. You understand? He just thinks he's sick. It's in his mind. And the boy said, yes, sir. And about a week later, the same lady came around trying to get some proselytes and bought her junk with her. And she said that the boy at the door, she said, now, young man, is your daddy home? And, and don't forget what I told you. He said, yes, sir, he's home. She said, can I see him? And the little boy said, I'm sorry, he can't come. And the lady said, and why not? And, and don't forget now, don't forget what I told you. Yes, sir. Yes, sir, he can't come now. Now he thinks he's dead. You get those kind of things, you see. Jesus Christ was perfect purity, and there wasn't any mental gymnastics or mental manipulation about it. He was sinless. Now we have a number of testimonies regarding Christ's sinlessness. For example, Jesus himself saw sin in others and saw no sin in himself. Wasn't that rather egotistical of him? If he was like Buddha or Muhammad? Wasn't that rather stupid to go on pointing out sin in other people, never confessing any himself? Rather egotistical, wouldn't you say? In John 8, 46, six, he said, Which of you convinces me of sin? He was without sin. He was the only man that could ever make an honest claim that he had no sin, and Jesus never admitted a fault or ever asked for forgiveness of sins from anybody. Now, how does that line up with the other religious leaders, huh? What do you make of that? You people who think that Jesus Christ was a great teacher, aren't you a little bit addled? Who ever heard of a great teacher who never confessed making a mistake? Who ever heard of a great teacher who constantly pointed out mistakes in other people and judged them on the spot, and yet never judged himself? You call that a great teacher? Well, that's a clown. 
unless he was God manifested in the flesh. And that, like they say down south, is something else. Pontius Pilate, who was Jesus' judge, examined him and said three times, I find no fault in him. John 18, 38. What a testimony from a responsible judge under authority. I find no fault in him three times. Is that what a judge would say about you if your enemy is all you to court? Mrs. Pontius Pilate, a woman, wife of the judge, had no personal interest in Christ, either favorably or otherwise. But she told her husband, quote, Matthew 27, 19, Have thou nothing to do with that just man? The thief on the cross in Luke 23, 41 said, quote, This man hath done nothing amiss. I'm sure you have. I'm sure if you gave Buddha a dollar for every day in his life he did something amiss, he could catch a plane from there to Paris. A guilty murderer was dying, and his testimony, dying of capital punishment, was, This man hath done nothing amiss. Judas Iscariot, a disciple of our Lord, in his earthly ministry gave a testimony, and if anybody could have detected a flaw or a weakness or a sin in Christ, it would have been one of his disciples, with whom he lived, ate, walked, and talked with for three and a half years. I mean, familiarity breeds contempt. Do you need to tell me that a man that lived and ate and slept and walked with the Lord Jesus Christ for three and a half years couldn't find anything wrong with him if there was something wrong with him? Tell me where else you found that in history. Judas Iscariot saw the miracles, heard the teaching, observed him closely, finally betrayed him for thirty pieces of silver. And he testifies in Matthew 27, 4, quote, I have sinned in that I have betrayed innocent blood. Jesus was innocent of sin. And the Roman centurion, Luke 23, 47, said, Certainly this was a righteous man. Now there's a wonderful testimony from a hardened Roman soldier. Look at the evidence. His own disciples couldn't find fault with him. The Pharisees couldn't find fault with him rightly. His judge said he's all right. The judge's wife said he was all right. The condemned criminal with him said he was all right. The man who sold him out said he was all right. And the centurion who took care of the execution said he's all right. That's some testimony, isn't it? Now, in our next broadcast, we'll take up some of the arguments against the Savior's sinlessness and discuss these at length. But for now, notice that he's the only man, according to the record, who ever lived, whom nobody could point a finger at and say, You have sinned. Now, the Pharisee said, Well, he broke the Sabbath. He quoted Scripture to him to prove that the Lord was Lord of the Sabbath as well as the Lord of anything else. They pointed their fingers at him and said, You have cast out devils by the prince of devils, Beelzebub. And when he answered them, they couldn't answer him back. Did you ever study your Bible and see how many questions they asked him that he answered and how many questions he asked them they couldn't answer? When they got all through that rigmarole, Jesus finally said to them, after the best brain of the day had been turned loose on him, he said, all right, I'm going to ask you a question now, boys. You ready? They said, yes. He said, okay, here it comes. Back in Psalm 110, David, speaking by the Holy Spirit, called his son Lord. If he's David's son, the Messiah, why does David call his own son Lord? Did you ever hear of a Jewish father addressing his son as Lord? Or any Oriental for that matter? Why, of course not. You know what the Bible says about those people when he asked them that question? The Bible said, from that day forward, no man dared him ask him any more questions. Now, you're going to be put to it either now or later. We might as well put you to it now and get out easy. One of these days or nights, you are going to have to face the fact that Jesus Christ was either God manifested in this flesh as a sinless, perfect human being who never made a mistake in his life, or else he was one of the biggest liars, one of the most hypocritical charlatans that ever lived, and there isn't any middle ground granted one way or another unless you're as crooked as a con man yourself. You say, how do you figure that, Dr. Ruckman? I figure it this way. Any man who is a good man, as we call a man a good man, 
but who was not God manifest in the flesh, had no business letting people worship him, which Christ did. He had no business pointing out the sins of religious leaders, which he did. And he certainly should have asked somebody to forgive him for making an error at least once or twice in his life, which he didn't. And he certainly, when he prayed to God the Father, should have confessed some sin in his life, which he didn't. Now, how do you say the man was a good man when he was the most egotistical man that ever lived? How do you call him a good teacher and a good man when he said to you, exactly as I said to you over these microphones, you couldn't even get to heaven unless you came by him? Is that any way for a humble man to talk? No, sooner or later, friend, you're going to have to face it. You might as well face it now as face it the white throne judgment before you go out into the lake of fire. You might as well bow your knee to the Lord Jesus Christ now and confess him as your Savior rather than bow it out there in eternity at the white throne judgment and face the fact that Jesus Christ was either who he professed to be, God manifested in the flesh, the Lord of glory, the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, superior to any religious teacher who ever lived, whoever will live, superior to any follower of anybody whose disciple believed anything or was taught anything by anybody with any kind of proof, or else he was a faker. And there it is. And to those of us who believed on him as our Savior and trusted him as our Lord and Savior, there is no doubt left. We know who he was. And we know who he is. And we know there is one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who was tempted in all points like as we are, yet without sin. God sent one man into this world without sin, and that man was a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, and he bore our chastisement. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes were healed, as God made his soul an offering for sin, for he became sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Now, if you don't believe that, try it. If you don't believe that, put it to the test. And if you think his body is still over there in Jerusalem rotting in a hole in the ground, trust him as your Savior today, and I'm sure God will do exceeding abundantly for you more than all that you can ask or think. Our Savior is not dead. He's not buried. He is alive, amen, forevermore, and has the keys of death and hell. May the Lord bless you, and good day.